make up our central nervous system. The brain is about a, somewhere, at the estimate is 100 billion nerve cells make up a brain. So that's heaps and heaps. And then on top of the nerve cells, you've got all the synaptic connections to make the entire brain the weight and size that it is. Right, the cerebrum, the main big lump of the brain, is our seat of consciousness, and that is surrounded, it's kind of overlaid with the cerebral cortex, which is quite a thin layer. And when we look at the cerebral cortex, um, it's quite interesting, well, again, when we're looking at movement, all right, Here's a central sulcus that divides the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. When you look at the central sulcus, what you see on, in the cortex is that the motor cortex lies right at the back of the frontal lobe on one side of the central sulcus. And on the other side, you've got the sensory cortex is right at the front of the parietal lobe. Right? So those two areas of the brain, the sensory area and the motor area, lie very, very close to each other within the brain, which is part of the reason why we're able to respond so quickly to things. Imagine if that sensory area was down here somewhere and all that information had to travel all across the brain to get to the motor cortex in order for us to respond to some information we were receiving. Right? Our responses would be significantly delayed while that information traveled across the brain. So the fact that those two areas lie so close to each other enables us to get very, very strong interaction between sensory information and motor responses. Okay. Um, then down here, we have our cerebellum. So this is the front of the head, this is the back of the head. And the motor signal, once the motor cortex initiates the signal, the signal has to go through the cerebellum to get to the spinal cord. And the cerebellum is the part of the brain that fine tunes the motor response and adds coordination and tweaks so that we're very distinct in that response. All right, so the cerebellum is responsible for helping us coordinate the initial signal from the motor cortex. Okay. Uh, let's see, where else? Uh, the brain stem is in here. Okay, the brain stem is responsible for regulating heart rate, breathing, blood pressure, all things that we see changes occurring very rapidly when we are exercising. So that's a very important structure when we're looking at our homeostasis and getting things back under control. All right, now, in, in your textbook, on page 117, they have a nice little box about concussion. So a lot of you are competing athletes. There's a lot of information out there on concussion. We're finding out more and more about the problems that surround concussion in sports. Um, not only with professional athletes, but we've got, we're seeing 16 year olds who are suffering their third or fourth clinically diagnosed concussion, right? And it's a big problem. Um, they're trying to come up with better ways of how do we assess if someone has a concussion, because if they have one, they shouldn't be continuing to play, they should be pulled out of the game. 
So most of the concussion tests are quite complicated and you have to be elsewhere in a quiet room and so I can't do that in the middle of the game. How do I assess whether someone has a concussion right there and then? So there's quite a lot of research looking at a test called a KD test. It's an online, on the sideline assessment that they're trying to show is a valid way of pulling people out. Right? Concussions are a really big problem. And part of the problem is they don't always result in a blackout, in loss of consciousness. So it's difficult sometimes to identify that they occurred. Okay. The concussion occurs when the brain, there's, the brain sits in a little bit of fluid within the skull. And usually the brain is relatively stable, but if you take a big hit, if you hit your head on the floor or someone smacks you, then the brain can bang against the inside of the skull and get bruised. And that's ultimate, that's a very basic description of what a concussion is. Right? So it can affect memory, it can affect speech, it can affect coordination. Um, the impact, the, the symptoms that you get may not occur straight away. So you can't rely on seeing the symptom to diagnose if someone should come off the field. You've got to be paying attention to what is happening with their head. If you see someone's head hit the floor, or you see someone hit someone in the head, that person should be taken off the field for checking. Because you can't tell straight away always. If it's a bad enough hit, then you're going to be able to tell quite quickly because they're going to be all over the place. But you can't always, and it doesn't have to be a bad hit for it to cause a problem down the line. All right? um, once you've had a concussion, and here's part of the problem, is one concussion means you are now more prone to another one, according to the literature. So once you've had one, you're at much more risk of having a second one the next time you get hit. And there is increasing evidence linking these concussions to long-term damage to the brain that causes uh, Parkinson's disease, uh, possibly depression. There have been some very high-profile suicides in athletics, particularly amongst football players, where they have committed suicide because of depression and feeling lack of control over their lives, right? So there's, I am not aware yet that we have proved that concussion causes these things, but there is a, an increasing body of evidence that is suggesting that very strongly. And there's certainly a lot of work going on with it. Several of these high profile people that committed suicide wrote notes asking their family to donate their brains to research because they thought something was wrong with them. So we're getting quite a lot of information looking posthumously at this brain tissue and analyzing it against anecdotal things that they said about how they were feeling. Uh, possible risk with epilepsy, so with seizures further down the line. So there's some long-term health problems. And as I said, we're now seeing, because we're getting better at identifying them, we're finding in high school athletes, kids who are 16 who have had three concussions already. Right? Well, if that's my child, I'm sorry, you get to play the piano now. Right? But being a great athlete gets you a free ride to school, right? And school over here is expensive. So now if you're the parent and you can't afford to put your kid through school, do you let them keep playing sport because that gets them into school? It's quite a philosophical dilemma. Okay. So it's a, it's a complicated picture. It's not as simple as just saying, okay, that's it, you're not playing anymore. You, you are done. Well, now what? Now I get to go pack bags at Walmart? 
Not that packing bags at Walmart is bad, but what if I had the potential to be a brain surgeon and I don't get to go to school? So it's a big problem, it's a big, and it's a complicated picture. What a how, if we can identify people who are at risk. So there's lots of research going on into helmets right now. Because there's an argument, do helmets help or do helmets make it worse? Helmets technically protect the head a little bit, right? And they are getting more and more sophisticated with allowing the head to move within the helmet so that the brain doesn't bang up against now the side, indirectly the side of the helmet. Highly, highly sophisticated pieces of equipment. But now they're finding that someone who has a helmet on thinks they can do anything they like. It doesn't matter how hard I hit the floor, it doesn't matter how hard I hit that other person, because I've got a helmet on, I'm okay. Mm -mm. That's not the case. So now there's a big argument. Are helmets better or worse? Do they encourage tackling and hard hitting? Or do they protect the athlete? Okay. As I said, it's a complicated picture. Okay. What? Today, actually, very interestingly, I got an email through with a new piece of research that is looking at student athletes who do not report concussion symptoms. And what they're finding is that, so they were looking at why would someone choose not to report the fact that they've got a split in a headache or they're seeing double vision or they feel sick or whatever the symptom is. Okay? And what they're finding is that the primary reason for under-reporting a suspected concussion, they were looking at Division I athletes. Okay? So these are, pre these are talented athletes. Their primary reason for not reporting the suspected concussion was that they didn't think the blow to the head was serious enough to cause the concussion. So even though they're sh they know they're showing the symptoms, they don't believe it can really be concussion because the hit wasn't that hard. Right? Well, how hard do you have to be hit? I mean, that's, that's bizarre to me. But that's a brand new piece of research. So that's going to be some quite interesting questions that that will open them up. So if you go into coaching in particular, I would say concussions are going and knowing about concussions and I being able to have a good feel for someone hitting their head is going to play a very big role in your lives for the, re for the rest of your career. Because that whole picture is only getting bigger. In PE, I would say you're probably going to be expected to have some understanding about it, but I suspect the pressure will be a little bit less on you as a PE teacher than as a coach. Not sure that's right, because you can hit your head in PE as well. But I suspect you won't be quite so much under the magnifying glass as a PE teacher. Gadget. I do that with my purse in all my put my purse down, walk away. Okay, spinal cord. I'm gonna let you guys cover the spinal cord. And I don't I forgot to put my watch on, so yell at me. What time is it now? 135. And a knee tap, look at a knee tap because I want to run through reciprocal innovation and I don't want to do it too quickly. Um, all right, so reciprocal innovation is a type of reflex that's trainable, which makes it really interesting. When we're in sport, we use reflexes a lot. Imagine baseballs, uh, baseball cricket are great examples, right? How and softball, sorry girls, right? 
Imagine how fast that ball is moving when it leaves a bag. Right? And how quickly you react to trying to catch that ball. Right? You actually can't react that fast if all that information had to go up to your brain and your brain had to make the decision and all that information came back down. Right? So it's a long time ago when you first started learning that skill, but try to think about how much quicker you are at reacting to the ball now versus when you first started playing. And part of that quickness, that increase in how fast you can respond, is due to the fact that you train the reflex. So some of that information doesn't go up to the brain, it circles around in the spinal cord and the motor response is um, coordinated from the spinal column. Okay. So, uh, let's have a look. Here's our, here's our, We've got information coming to the spinal cord. It synapses both directly to back to the muscle in the agonist. And remember we said if I'm going to do something with the agonist, I also have to coordinate the antagonist. Right. So we also see an interneuron that sends information to the antagonist. So I'm able to move my hand very, very quickly because I can turn on the primary mover and I can damp down the muscle on the other side of the joint. Right? And the more you train that, the more you practice catching at fast speed, the quicker this information and this connection and this reflex can occur. So it's a trainable, trainable idea, which is, I think, quite interesting. That, that we can train, it's called reciprocal innovation. So the reciprocity is this ability to also coordinate what the antagonist is doing, as well as turn on the agonist. So central nervous system, brain, spinal column, peripheral nervous system, everything outside the spinal column. Okay. Different nerves, we're particularly interested in our motor nerve, but there's nerves going to your heart, there's nerves going to your digestive system, to your kidneys, right? Tons and tons. Anybody ever go and see the body or any of those those um, displays when they come through. You, you see that one? If you ever get the chance, if you're ever in a city where one of those is on show, go. It is phenomenal. Right? They have an entire nervous system separated out from a body and in a glass case and you just get to see all the nerves. It's amazing how many nerves there are. I mean, it's unfathomable. Even when you see it, you're just like, oh my God. It's really, really worthwhile going to one of those shows. So we've got two subdivisions then of our peripheral nervous system. We have the autonomic system and the sensory somatic system. Our autonomic nervous system controls unconscious physiological functions such as our heart rate. Like you don't have to sit here, bless you. You're not sitting here thinking, oh, my heart has to be, oh, my blood pressure needs to come down, right? Or I need to digest lunch. Right? All of that happens without you thinking about it. That's all controlled by the autonomic nervous system. And then 
that system subdivides. So if you go back to that um, chart earlier on, it subdivides into the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, so we've got central and peripheral. On the peripheral, we have autonomic and somatosensory, and then our autonomic subdivides into sympathetic and parasympathetic. So our sympathetic nervous system, remember unconscious, is also our fight or flight system. Right? This is the system that helps us punch the tiger on the nose or turn and run like heck. Okay, and climb a tree. So anything we need to survive, and it's typically a stress response. So some kind of stressor initiates the fight or flight, flight response, initiates the sympathetic nervous system. Remember that exercise, although it's typically considered a good stress, is still a physiological stress. So when I exercise, a lot of what we see happen when we exercise is turned on and controlled via the sympathetic nervous system. So, my increase in heart rate and blood pressure. If I have to run from a tiger, I better make sure there are nutrients and oxygen getting to my muscles so that I can get the heck away. Right? That makes sense. More blood flow to the skeletal muscles. So, what we see when this system kicks in is that we divert blood flow away from central organs that are not important at that point out to the muscles that we need to contract very quickly to get away. All right. It helps release glucose from the liver. So remember that glycogen, one of the storage forms, is in liver. So I can turn that glycogen into glucose, I can release it into the bloodstream, and it can provide more um, fuel for me to make ATP. And also, we start to break down glycogen a little bit quicker within the muscles when this system kicks in. Right. So, anything that's dangerous, anything that's exciting, anything that is upsetting, right? any stress sets this part of the nervous system into play. So, that's quite an important point when we come back and start looking at overtraining. Because overtraining isn't just what you do on the field or in the gym. Overtraining has to look at your whole lifestyle. Because your actual training program may be just about borderline okay. But if you're moving house or you're starting a new job, or you have to pass this next exam, or you're kicked off the team. Now you've got all this additional stress. Our body doesn't distinguish between stress. Stress is stress is stress. Right? It doesn't matter what it is. It all adds up to stress. So when we come back later in the semester and look at overtraining, that you need to remember that point. The other part is our parasympathetic nervous system. This is our rest and digest. This is my, I'm chilled, I'm nice and relaxed, I'm in control, right? I'm either at rest or I might be at work but I'm not stressed about work. I'm not exercising when this system is predominant. Right? because that's a stressor. I might be eating and digesting food, right? all the other kinds of unconscious things that occur if I'm not trying to get away from the tiger. Right? So the parasympathetic system is the one that is responsible for helping that homeostasis idea that we talked about. Right? 
I've got to get all these things that went completely haywire while I did my training session for an hour. I've got to get them all back under control now. I've got to get my heart rate back down. I have to get my body temperature back down. I've got to get my blood pressure back down. Um, so, parasympathetic <coughs> nervous system is responsible for slowing my heart rate back down. Right? That's good. I don't want it to stay at 150 beats per minute. I'd like it back at 65 beats per minute as quickly as possible. Okay, so we switch off parasympathetic, uh, we switch off sympathetic and or we turn up parasympathetic and we get our heart rate back under control. Increases blood flow to the skin and the viscera, so now I can digest my food. Right? On um, there's quite a nice table. Pink is that? I can't believe I forgot my watch. Uh, oh, just above where the concussion information is, there's a little table. No, wait, that's the wrong one. Hang on, hang on, hang on. The one I want you to look at. I want you to look at. Ah, there it is. 125. There's a table that gives you, it, it very nicely splits up what's the organ we're looking at and what role do the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems have on that organ. Pay particular attention to the stomach, right? Because if I'm in stress mode, if my sympathetic system is predominant, then digestion slows down, peristalsis is slowed down, and your food is kind of, digestion's just basically put on the back burner, right? Which is why you should not eat right before training. Because that food is gonna, or competing, that food is gonna sit there and not do anything until you stop exercising and your parasympathetic system is now predominant. Right? So you gotta be very careful and again we'll come back and look at what kinds of things should we have just before a competition or just before training. Right? You don't want something that is gonna sit there and not digest and make you feel uncomfortable while you're trying to exercise. The parasympathetic nervous system is trainable. So we see changes in when and how much the parasympathetic nervous system kicks in with training. So what happens to your heart rate if you do a lot of aerobic work, your resting heart rate? What do you expect to happen to resting heart rate if you do a lot of aerobic exercise? It goes down. Right? So the parasympathetic nervous system must be trainable because the parasympathetic nervous system will have to turn up a little bit to bring your heart rate down further. Does that make sense? So we actually train this system when we're exercising. Did I run out of time? You yes. guys are packing up. Okay. <laughs> Of the autonomic nervous system. Is that 